just keep me from all wrong. I'll be satisfied as long as I walk. Let me walk close to Thee. Just a closer walk with Thee. Jesus is my plea. Daily walking close to thee. Let it be, dear Lord, let it be. When my feeble life is old. Jesus is my plea. I've said it many, many times. I don't like multi-talented preachers. Man, I tell you, Denny did a great job last Sunday night. I was blessed, and I was blessed again tonight. And uh, Brother Pentico, you did it. Where Brother Pentico? There he's in. You did a great job too. And I, I'm hesitant to put this out on the web because I'm afraid that people will be after our singers all the time. Nobody's after the preaching, but they're after the singing. All, we are blessed to have the singers at our church that we do. I mean, and Miss Bonnie plays the piano, sings, and does whatever she can do, and whatever she does, she is a blessing. And uh, where did Miss Bonnie go? I don't know where she went, but uh, there she is in the back. Okay. Uh, Turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. And we're going to read verses 18 through 29. Revelation chapter 2, verses 18 through 29. It might help you. Revelation chapter 2 is right before Revelation chapter 3. And so... That might help you to find it right there. Revelation, the last book of the Bible, the second chapter. Revelation chapter 2, beginning with verse number 18. And unto the angel of the church at Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. I know thy works, and charity, and service, and faith, and thy patience, and thy works, and the last to be more than the first. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest, sufferest means that he permits, you permit, thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication. This is spiritual fornication here. And to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed and them that commit adultery with her in a great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. 
and I will kill her children with death. And all the churches shall know that I am he which searches the reins and hearts. And I will give unto every one of you according to your works. But I say unto you, I say unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden, but that which ye have already hold fast till I come. And he that overcometh and keepeth my words unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. As the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my father. And I will give him the morning star. He that hath an ear, if you've got a spiritual ear, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Let's pray. Father, one more time, I ask for your power, your anointing, as I preach and teach from thy word. And I'll be careful to praise you for the results. In Jesus' name, amen. There's an age-old question that every man perhaps it sometimes is asked and certainly in every age it's been asked why do good men suffer and wicked men prosper why is it that people that try to live right and do right and love God throughout the history of the church have suffered but people that do not love God seem to prosper well, the answer to that is very easy according to the scriptures. The wicked will soon go to destruction. Can you imagine living 60 or 70 or 80 years and having the best this world has to offer? Living high on the hog and low on the chicken and then dying and spending eternity in hell? So they did prosper here. This was all the heaven they would ever have. I've also found it true that God will protect his own and will keep them forever. The worst they can do, and Jesus said, fear not them which can kill the body, but fear him which kills the soul forever and ever in hell. There are special blessings to those people who love God and go to church, have an open mind, and they're hungry for truth. Now, they may suffer as far as this world goes, but God has special blessings for those people that love him. Jesus loves his church. Now, you mark it down. He loves his church. That's the only institution that the Lord Jesus ever started. And he gave his life for the church. And the reason the Lord Jesus has left his church here, and when I speak about a church, I'm not speaking about some invisible church. There's no such thing as that. But I'm talking about local New Testament churches. The reason why he leaves his churches here is so that man can be blessed and magnify the Lord Jesus. That's what the purpose of our church is. Our church is to take the gospel out and bless men with a soul-saving gospel of Jesus Christ. And the way we do that is magnify our Savior. We lift Jesus up. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto myself. Every saved person should live in and through a local New Testament church and serve God in and through a church. I'm convinced of that. I'm not really in favor of these independent ministries. They need to be tied to a church. And I'm convinced that what God blesses is the things that are done in and through his church. In Revelation chapter 2 and 3, we see that the Lord Jesus writes seven letters to seven churches that were in existence at that time. It would appear that heaven opened and the Lord Jesus Christ himself dictated these seven letters to the Apostle John. John looked up and he saw seven golden lampstands. 
And in the midst of these lampstands was none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. And John looked and he saw Jesus in the midst of these seven lampstands. And Jesus had seven stars in his right hand. He then explains what the meaning of that is. The Lord Jesus said those seven lampstands are his seven churches. The churches that the letters were written to in Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3. And he said that he is in the midst. In the midst is in the middle. In the center of his churches. Aren't you glad that the Lord Jesus Christ is in his churches? Now we're going to see later on that there was a church that Jesus was standing on the outside of that church, knocking, wanting to come in, but they didn't let him in. I am glad that the Lord Jesus Christ is at the center of Anchor Bible Baptist Church. That's the reason we're here. And mark it down, he is here with us tonight. John looked and he saw Jesus was in the center of his churches. The seven stars in his hand, the Lord said, are his pastors, his messengers. Messengers. And praise the Lord that the Lord Jesus Christ holds his pastors in his hands. And I'm so glad that the Lord called me to preach. I didn't just one day decide to be a preacher. I didn't just one day say, well, that would be a good vocation to enter in. Just as clearly as I know any truth in my life, I know there was a time in my life when the Lord's Holy Spirit dealt with me and called me to be a preacher. I think it was perhaps an answer to a prayer that my dad had given when I was brought home from the little clinic in Mercedes when I was born. I told you about that. My dad brought me home from the clinic and he told my mother to go in the house. And then my dad held me, a, a cute little baby I was. I've seen the pictures. I told Pam today, I was looking at my baby pictures and I said, I think that's one of the cutest babies it has ever been. And I, and, uh, but my dad held me up to heaven and he said, God, make a preacher out of my boy. And I think in answer to that prayer, later on in my life, after the Lord saved me when I was nine years old, and then later, I think in answer to my dad's prayer, God called me to preach. I know he called me to preach. I tell you, if he hadn't called me to preach, there'd have been many times I'd have thrown in the towel and said, it's not worth it, Brother Montag and you other preachers that are here. I think you know what I'm talking about. It's not a bed of roses. It's not easy all the time. One time you years ago I said it if you want me to describe my ministry it's been one battle after the other one fight after the other I've often said I do not believe in reincarnation but if I did I'd like to come back as a bulldog because there's a couple deacons I'd like to bite <laughs> But the Lord Jesus called me to preach, and I'm glad that God has his preachers in his hand. And he's guiding them, and he's protecting them, and he's taking care of them. These seven churches that these letters were written to were churches that existed at that time. But the truths that the Lord shared that John shared that Jesus gave him to these seven churches are truths for all churches. Now I know when we study this there's different ways to study these seven churches that they represent seven successive uh, stages of church history. For instance, we know that the first church, Ephesus, that was a period of church history. And the next church, Smyrna, that was a period of church history. I know that. But I'm not going to be preaching tonight prophetic statements or sermons, nor will I be preaching doctrinal sermons. But instead, I'm going to look at these seven letters and we started with this several weeks ago. I'm going to look at them and take messages that the Lord had for those churches that would be applicable to Anchor Bible Baptist Church and bring some practical lessons for us that will help us today. And so let's begin this message tonight with the church at Smyrna. We've looked at the other churches already, but the church at Smyrna, we could call this the church that was seduced by Jezebel 
Jezebel. The church that was seduced by Jezebel. And we're going to, this will be the first part of these as I've looked at these other churches and, and I don't want to take them all in one night. There's too many practical truths that I want to share with you. But tonight I want to look at the first part of this message. Look again, if you would, at verse number 18. And unto the angel, remember that's unto the pastor, the messenger of the church, a local church in Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. Let me begin by saying this. There has never been a perfect church. The Thyatira church was not perfect. None of the seven churches in Revelation are perfect. There's never been a perfect church. And those of you that come to Anchor Bible Baptist Church, let me say to you, Anchor Bible Baptist Church is not a perfect church. But we are the Lord's church, but there's never been a perfect church. The reason is every member of this church is human and humans are not sinless. Humans have not reached full perfection yet. We're not sinless. I know there's some people that say that they get to the place in their life where they never sin anymore. And there's some people that, that have actually said that. They get to the place they never sin. I was talking to a man one time, and he said he now lived above sin. I said, really? I said, where do you live? He said, I live above a beer joint. And, uh, <laughs> and so he did live above sin right there. I had a man tell me one time, I was out visiting when I was in the Piney Woods of East Texas, and he, he was out there, and he told me that he never sinned. He had, it had been 30 years or something since he sinned. I said, I'd like to talk to your wife about that. And he ran me off. Can you believe that? <laughs> We're humans. And the fact is, if you're saved, you don't want to sin. It grieves me when I sin. I wish I didn't sin. And it grieves me when I do things that displease the Lord. It grieves me when I don't do things that I know I ought to do. But the battle describes that inside us there's two natures that are battling with each other. And the truth is, sometimes I probably like you, feed the wrong nature. We listen to the wrong kind of stuff. We watch the wrong kind of stuff. Sometimes we're around the wrong kind of people, and as a result, that old nature takes control, and we say or do something that we shouldn't do. But if you're saved, it ought to grieve you when you sin. What really bothers me is somebody that says they're a Christian, and then they sin, and it doesn't bother them. It just seems like it's all right. I was telling somebody the other day, when you sin, it's going to bother you. And, and I mentioned some things. And I said, uh, if, uh, I think without question, we know we should, a Christian should not smoke. We, I think we know that. Yeah. Now, I'm not preaching against smoking tonight, but we know a Christian should not smoke. Somebody said, well, it doesn't bother me when I smoke. No, but I said, the first time you ever smoked, it did. The first time you ever stole a cigarette or got a cigarette butt and went behind a building because you didn't want anybody to see you did it, I guarantee you your conscience bothered you then and it bothered you the next time. That's why you hid from it. That's why you hope your mom and dad would never find out about it. But no, you've been doing it for 30 years every day. Your conscience has been seared with hard iron. It doesn't bother you anymore. But brother, as Christians, when we do things that are wrong, it bothers me it bothers me and and our and our consciences should torment us and the fact is I want to live a sinless life that's my desire I want to I don't I'd like to though I'd like to live a sinless life the churches in Revelation were full of people just like us people that were not perfect people that were not sinless 
sin had found a way to get into this Thyatira church. And he got in the church and really affected the church greatly. And the same thing happens today if we're not careful. We've got to be careful that sin doesn't come into the church. We've got to be careful that wrong doctrine doesn't come into the church. I've been told that about some churches that, that have let some wrong things come in. And brother, when you let wrong things come in, a little leaveneth, leaveneth the whole loaf. Leaven is as sin. And I, I know of churches that have people that are teaching Sunday school and Baptist churches that don't believe in the eternal security of the believer. Brother, if I knew that, brother, they would be replaced. I wouldn't kick him out of church, but I say, you're not going to teach. You need to be taught. You don't let somebody that doesn't believe you can lose your salvation teach in Sunday school. You don't do that. And a church is going to have troubles when they do that. I know some churches, they'll have people come in, a Baptist church, some tongue speakers. And they'll let them come in and start teaching or ministering in the church. When you do that, you're going to have trouble. Now, I speak in tongues. I speak in the English tongue, and I speak in the, in the Spanish tongue a little bit. But I also can, and I, and I tell you, I, I did this the other day to a Pentecostal person, and he was so stupid when it comes to the Bible that he thought that I'd committed the unpardonable sin because he started talking about uh, tongues and different things. And so I just raised my head, and I said, Hustle a shandai untie a bow tie. Hustle a shandai untie a bow tie. He said, you've got it, you got it. And I said, you fool, I was making fun of you. <laughs> he said, you blaspheme the Holy Ghost. You're going to spend eternity in hell. I say, you know very little about the Holy Spirit. I found out those people that speak the most about the Holy Ghost know the least about Him. Those of you that haven't taken my course on the Holy Spirit, you ought to take that course. You will learn more than you ever thought you'd learn straight from the Bible. But these tongue speakers that think they know so much about the Holy Spirit, they don't know anything about Him. But I know of some Baptist churches that have some tongue speakers that are teaching in the class, teaching other people there. You oughtn't to let them in there. I mean, somebody ought to have some courage and, and step up. Now, Donald Trump isn't, you know, I hope he's saved. I hope he's been born again. I don't know if he is or not. If he is, he's a baby Christian. But I tell you one thing you've got to admire him for, he's got courage. He went up there in Washington, D.C. among all of those snakes up there and he stood up to them in a way that, the only way they could understand. But there need to be some pastors or some leaders in these churches that would have enough courage to go to some of these people and tell them you're not going to teach here anymore. You're not going to minister anymore. Just sit back there and keep your mouth shut. You're not going to do it. You need to learn. You're not able to start teaching. Well, the Thyatira church had let sin get into the church. And some of the members had gotten led astray by a wicked woman named Jezebel. In verse number 18, we want to look at the writer of this letter to the church at Thyatira. It describes this writer right here in verse 18. These things saith the Son of God. And then it says, notice the Son of God. That's who wrote it. This wasn't written by that great Old Testament figure Moses or that great Old Testament figure Abraham or that old great Old Testament figure David. It wasn't written by Peter or John or Paul. This letter was written by none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that's who wrote this. And if Jesus, since Jesus wrote this letter, we ought to take special note of it. Since it was him... Uh, it says in verse 18, These things saith the Son of God. Not David, not Moses, not Paul, not Peter. But these things saith none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. You know what I found today? We live in an age where many people don't fear God anymore. 
We have church members that just simply don't fear God anymore. The reason is they've been taught when the Bible says fear God, that means just have a reverence from God. Baloney. If God does tell us to reverence Him, but He tells us to fear Him, and there's a difference between fearing God and reverencing God. God is holy, and we are not. And we ought to fear God. There's some things we ought to be afraid to do, lest God deals with us about it. This letter was written by the Lord Jesus Christ. Many people today don't fear God anymore. I'll say more about it. The lost people. The so-called comedian. Have you ever seen a bigger joke than the jokers that are on TV? They're calling themselves comedian. What happened to the days of Jack Benny and Red Skelton and, and the great comedians that said things funny? Today, these jokers get up there and they be as vulgar as they can. And the people out there are laughing at it. Brother, there was a time in our history in America that even lost people would not have said those things. Even lost people feared what God may do. There was a time in our country when even lost people feared what God might do to them. And as a result, they respected the preacher and respected the Bible and respected the church. They may not have gone, but they respected them. Lost people today I think don't realize this and by the way if they would teach this in the public schools and in our colleges today it would change America that every person that they're teaching is one day going to face God if you realize that you're one day going to face God that would make a difference in the way that you live if you realize that one day when this life is over that you're going to stand before God and face a holy and righteous God and give an answer for what you did with the Lord Jesus Christ and what you did with the Bible and what you did with the Lord's church it would make a difference if you told little boys and girls that you better realize that one day you're going to stand before God of course in our government churches today schools they won't let them say that anymore but not only will the law stand before God but Christians don't miss this you're Christians you've been saved you're one day going to stand before God and many Christians are going to stand before God and when they look back over their life, they're not going to get one single reward because they neglected their duties as Christians. When you got saved, my friend, it wasn't just saved so that you could go to heaven when you die. If that was the case, God could have taken you right then. You were saved to serve God. And you have duties that God expects you to fulfill. And one of these days, if you feared God and realized that truth, it would make a difference in the way that you serve God as a Christian. Not only that, there's a lot of Christians that don't live right. A lot of preachers that don't live right. There's a lot of Christians in our churches that live double lives. Many of them are what I call the country club crowd. Now, I'm not judging their salvation. Only God can do that. But I can look at their lives and see that they live double lives. I know of many... Christians in churches, the country club crowd, I told them. They go out to the country club on Saturday night and drink their cocktails and have their parties there. And then they come to church on Sunday and lift their hands and say, oh, how I love Jesus. Don't tell me you love Jesus when you live like the devil all week long. One of these days you're going to stand before God. There's many Christians in our churches that steal from God. I don't know why it is. It, it just seems so simple to me that I don't know why it is that it's so hard for many Christians to learn the principle of tithing. You know, God's going to get the tithe. The Bible says the tithe belongs to the Lord. He's going to get it. 
I had a cousin contact me one time. He's a sheriff in a West Texas county, or was years ago. And he said, uh, Brother, jo he said, Johnny, he's my cousin. He said, what I do, uh, I give some money to the church, but I take some of my money, and I know some poor people in our county, and I go and help them with some of that. I said, why, you old devil, you. Here's my cousin, first cousin. I said, you devil, you. You're taking God's money that ought to go to the Lord's church. God gave you 90%. Why don't you take some of your own money and go help people? You selfish devil, you. I mean, God says the tithe, which is 10% of what you make, belongs to God. It doesn't belong to you. You don't give your tithe. You pay your tithe. I tell people, oh, I'm going to give my tithe where I want to. No, God tells us where the tithe goes. And if you don't pay your tithes, you're a thief and a robber. Amen. When I came to church tonight, I locked my car. One time Pamela said, why do you lock the car? I said, there's people that will be coming to church tonight. If they'll steal from God, they won't hesitate at all stealing from me. <laughs> The tithe belongs to the Lord. 10% of what you make belongs to God. And if you keep it and you don't pay it, you're stealing from God. But you don't think anything about it. But one day you're going to stand before God and give an answer to it. I know of other Christians that neglect some other duties. They don't put the Lord first. And then they wonder why they have problems in their life. God is very clear. Seek ye what? First the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added unto you. I've never met a tithing Christian that served God and was faithful in church, that put God first, that had problems meeting his basic needs. Now, he may not have been a... And by the way, in America, we live better than any other people in the world. Even poor people live better in America than most people in the world live. And you may not be able to eat a sirloin steak or fajita, but you can at least have a $1 hamburger from McDonald's occasionally. If you'll put God first place, if you'll put him first place in your life, if you'll pay your tithes and, and put him first place in your thinking and first place in the things you do, your basic needs are going to be taken care of. If that were not true, then Jesus lied. And if Jesus lied, he couldn't be our Savior. But he is our Savior, and he told us the truth. And if you'll put him first place in your life, then I guarantee you your basic needs will be taken care of. But many Christians don't. And as a result, they have troubles in this life, but it not be anything to the trouble that they're going to feel when they stand before the Lord and have to hang their head in shame because they had not put the Lord Jesus first. Christians, we need to mark it down. The Bible says, be sure your sin will find you out. You say, well, Brother Tisdale, uh, I don't tithe, and I'm not faithful to church, and, and I'm not doing things. You mark it down. Your sin will find you out. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. You mark it out. You're going to pay for it one of these days. God will not let sin go by unpunished. He's not going to do it. You may think you're getting by with it, but you mark it down. You remember what this preacher said tonight. Based upon the Word of God, sin is not going to go by unpunished. Just suppose you got a letter from the Lord Jesus Christ, a personal letter from Him, a fresh letter from Him, and the Lord Jesus pointed out your sins. He wrote and He said, uh, Stephen, and he writes this letter. He begins by saying, Stephen, I want you to know that I love you. You've done a good job uh, leading the singing, and you've done a good job singing. And, and, he, and he compliments you first. That's what he does in all of these seven letters. But then he looks at you and says, Stephen, I have a few things against you. And he starts naming some things in your life that he knows about. You know what you would do, Stephen, if you got a personal letter from Jesus, and he started pointing out things in your life, you know what you'd do? You'd make an effort to correct them. I assure you, you would. Well, we've got the Bible. 
And the Holy Spirit takes this message from Jesus to us. And he starts pointing out things in our life that are wrong, but we neglect it. We just think, well, we'll get by without doing it. But we should obey it. The Bible is a letter from God. It points out things that we're doing wrong. And it instru instructs us what we ought to do about them. If you've got an IQ over 70 and you've been saved and the Holy Spirit lives within you, you ought to obey the Bible. You ought to do what God says to do. If you do not, there's going to be severe repercussions. Now back to verse number 18. Thus saith the Son of God, and it describes him who hath eyes like likened to a flame of fire. It says that the Lord Jesus Christ has eyes that are like a flame of fire. You know what that means? That means that Jesus has intimate knowledge of all things. That means he knows everything that's going on. He knows everything that's going on at Anchor Bible Baptist Church. But he knows everything that's going on in your life as well. Those eyes, those piercing eyes, those eyes that are like a flame of fire, those eyes will pierce the darkest places. And you mark it down, my friend. Nothing is hidden from Jesus. We cannot hide our sins from him. We think we can sin and get by with it. And we might get by with it for six months or six years or 20 years. But you mark it down. You will not forever get by with it. He sees and knows what's going on. He has piercing eyes that looks in. Not only does he knows what's going on, he knows what your thoughts are about things. He knows what you think about other people. He knows the evil thoughts. I believe in vibes. Have you ever been around somebody and they said one thing, but there was a vibe that you felt that you knew that they weren't being honest? You knew they didn't like you. You knew they didn't care for you. You knew, but you, you felt it inside. Well, Jesus has eyes that pierce inside. And you can say what you want to say. And you might fool this preacher. And you may fool some of the people in church. You may even fool your spouse. But you're not going to fool God. You're not going to fool Jesus. He sees what no one else sees. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 13, it says, All things are naked. And open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. His eyes see everything. It's a great mistake to think that we can do anything without God knowing about it. It's a sad mistake to think when we get away from church, we go on a vacation, the pastor won't know, no one will know, but the Lord knows. It's a sad mistake to think you get away and you do like you want to and no one knows. The one that knows is the Lord. Let me see something else in verse 18. This letter is written from Jesus and it says he has eyes like unto a flame of fire and his feet are like fine brass. His feet are like fine brass. Brass symbolizes judgment. God cannot be silent in the face of sin. This Thyatira church had sin in it. And that sin was going to be judged. And it was going to have to be purged from that church. He has feet with fine brass symbolizing judgment. Adam and Eve there in the Garden of Eden thought that they could get by. But God took note about what happened. And he did something about it. They were cast from that beautiful place that God had made for them. And God is still going to judge today. We're not going to get by with it. He's still going to do it. Sin cannot be committed in our lives and go by unpunishment. Unpunished. Punishment may be delayed for a season, but it's going to come. So we see this letter in Revelation, written by Jesus, the only begotten Son of God. 
searching what's going on in the church and searching the, searching the lives of the members of the church with eyes of flame and trampling upon sin and sinners with feet of fine brass.